Well, we know that the pandemic has devastated the mental health of our youth and teenagers. The closure of schools, the anxiety of infections, and the staggering rise in mental health statistics for hospital and clinic admissions will affect a whole future generation. There has been a terrible emotional cost to parents, having this burden of homeschooling as well as working from home. But the rise in mental health issues for young people worldwide is inevitable. It's a result of the persistent neglect of mental health provision in government policy. The momentum has continued to build up and we will soon witness the costs to our nations for this neglect. And here to help me do just that is the child psychotherapist and supervisor, Alex Hearn. Alex works with schools, social services, parents and children in private practice. And in this episode, we're going to focus on the mental health issues for teenagers and their parents. Alex, hello. It's lovely to be with you. Um, can I just start by talking to you about the figures that came out quite recently, which dealt with the last half of, uh, of the last year, 2021, in terms of children's mental health conditions? And I mean, it was a staggering figure. They'd gone up by 77 percent. And I wanted to ask you, because you, you really meet people who are going through it, it, does that truly reflect the whole picture? And I'm wondering what kind of cases you come across? I think it does reflect the whole picture, Chrissy. And I think it's it's been such a, an unstable time. And as human beings, we need predictability, we need reliability, we need stability, we need consistency. And there hasn't been any of that. So it's like all the cracks that were there before are kind of magnified. I think that's how I sort of view it in a way. Um, particularly in terms of... So 77% would seem about right to you. I mean, it's very high, isn't it? I think, I mean, it it is high, but I I think in terms of what we know is sort of on the front line, you know, in terms of referrals or people are struggling or um, families, you know, desperate for kind of support um, and knowing that CAMs are completely overwhelmed, you know, I think it, it, it sounds about right. Can you give us a picture of the kind of problems you're encountering? So we hear a lot about children uh, with eating disorders, anxiety. I'm wondering what you see in your, in your practice. Yes, I think, that's, I think that's fair to say in terms of kind of presenting issues. That's how we would kind of describe it around anxiety, um, increased slow mood, more depressive kind of symptoms, suicidal thinking, you know, thoughts and ideas. Uh, and eating disorders, I know, definitely ha- have rocketed. There has been an increase in, in referrals around eating disorders. So um, I think generally kind of just feeling very, very wobbly and very anxious. And for some children and young people that were already kind of tended more towards that, that has really magnified, I think, for them. Alex, you were talking about us all needing predictability, and that is so true for everybody, whatever age they are. So I'm wondering whether the children who you see are suffering because of the pandemic and that not knowing if the variant's going away or what's going to happen or maybe someone's died in their family or whatever, or whether you spotted it before the pandemic? I think that's a really good question, Chrissy. I think this is is not about the pandemic and now suddenly mental health has got worse. I don't think that's the case. And I think, you know, that can be used as kind of optics. Oh, well, mental health has, you know, got really bad during the pandemic. But this has always been an issue. But I think what has happened during the pandemic is, things that have just been taken away. There's been so many losses, you know, school that for some children and young people represents a very safe place, hasn't been accessible or they've not been able to do things online or the children that already fall through the cracks in terms of social services are are lost. You know, they're kind of not being picked up. They're not being scooped up. They're kind of being missed. And there's lots around financial worries, fear of infection, parents juggling all these different demands, Um, and lots of grief and lots of losses. And I think that, so all of that is a kind of perfect storm, really. Indeed. I mean, in the introduction to you, I mentioned this persistent neglect of mental health provision in government policy. Perhaps you'd like to say something about that. Yes, I think this is this has been years in the making. So I, I remember one of my first placements and one of my first jobs was in a CAMS team 
which is a wonderful kind of multidisciplinary team with all different kind of clinicians. And we were offering long term support, systemic work, working with parents and families. And it was cut. So that was back in what, 2012, 2013. So this has been a long time in terms of services being cut and cut back and stripped back until there's nothing. We're, we're sort of working with bones in a way. And that's that's really hard. So it's a lack of funding and the resources being overstretched. So, again, it's just all of that in the mix just creates where we're at now. So that takes us back to CAMS. And for anybody who doesn't know about CAMS, the Children and Adolescent Mental Health Services. I mean, stories reach us that if you're lucky, you get the first appointment in the first six six months, maybe, or even a little sooner. But after that, the actual treatment, you know, there's very little hope of getting proper treatment for a year or more. It, yes, unfortunately. I mean, unfortunately, it is right. And obviously, working with children and young people we're at the front line of all of this and we hear we hear anecdotally from our clients you know what they what they've been struggling with or they've been on waiting lists or and we hear it from our colleagues as well and this really isn't about sort of bashing our colleagues and cams who are working incredibly hard and really doing what they can with the, with the system that is deeply imperfect and not set up to really support long-term change really in children and young people So the government don't get it. They don't care about the future of children because they're going to be our adults and they're going to carry this stuff forward, aren't they, their problems? They're not just going to disappear. Does anybody tell the government this stuff? I mean, (laughs) we're trying. I think there there are lots of bodies, you know, that are are trying. But I feel like as a clinician that is on the front line, you know, I am working with children and young people every day and I'm supervising those who are working with children and young people every day. And this is what I'm most passionate about is, is children and young people and their mental health. And it's like things are just, why are we not pouring more money into early intervention? Why are we not focusing on vulnerable parents and vulnerable infants? I mean, that's really, we should be really focusing on that rather than waiting to crisis, which is where we're at now. And then we offer short term, quick fix interventions that generally don't work and then the children just come back into the system but you're involved in the child psychotherapy council aren't you which sound like a august body who can shake the health minister and the whole government till they actually listen well that's our hope chrissy we're we're a new organization we're a registered charity and our aim is to is to build a body of child psychotherapists from all modalities and different kind of theoretical orientations to to lobby, to pursue funding, to to kind of raise the standards, I suppose, of, of what's being out there and what's being offered to children, young people who are incredibly vulnerable and, and really need the support. Well, I think you need to shout louder. I mean, I, you're, you, please don't think I'm getting at you. I mean, I had this conversation with Andrew Samuels and other psychotherapists And, you know, I think everyone agrees that psychotherapists, while doing a wonderful job, ought to come together as a lobby and shout a lot louder. Yeah, and I think there is something around not wanting to get too political, which I don't really agree with. I think as therapists, we have to be political. And I think, especially in terms of child mental health, I think we we have to, because so often we have to be the advocates for children that don't have a voice. They're very powerless, as opposed to adults that might have more autonomy over their lives. So, so let's go back to parents. I think the danger is, you know, we're going to do some parent bashing, which is, I speak as one, and so do you. And actually, most parents do the best they can. I mean, obviously, they're greatly affected by their own, how they were parented. But what would you be saying to parents who, first of all, how they see what's going on for their children? Are they attuned enough to their children? Or are they so busy, they just aren't keeping up with how their children are? That's quite a tough question. I think, I'm not sure, I I agree with you. I think parents are absolutely doing the best they can with the resources that they have available. And of course, we know that there's sort of transgenerational trauma is a very real thing. So how we were parented and how we were brought up affects then our, our relationships. It's it's all connected, isn't it? That sort of interpersonal kind of dynamic. So I suppose it's, I think parents sometimes just don't know what to do. They don't know what might help or, and there's so much 
even as a clinician, there's so much confusing information out there. Like, who do you go to seek support for? What does your child need? What do you need as a family? Because it's not always just about the, the child. It's also about the, the parent as well. I know you have a lot of experience with teenagers. Now, the trouble with teenagers is they have lots of trouble with their hormones anyway. So if you're a parent, how do you pick up where there's real, real problems to worry about? It's a good question. I think it's more about whether there's been an increase in certain things around uh, low mood, low, the affect kind of changing or things kind of seeming a bit more up and down, um, withdrawal from certain things that they like doing. Uh, loss of friendships, changes at school, um, any self-harm, you know, those kind of things, just noticing actually they're not, that, that they might not be themselves. And that might just be because actually there's a lot going on and they're being a teenager, but it might be that there's something else going on. And I suppose having that dialogue as much as you can, and it's hard with teenagers, isn't it? It's like you've got to be there and they have to be able to separate at the same time. I don't know why I'm laughing because it's it's an awful business because they don't talk to you half the time, do they? You're lucky if you find the 10 minutes, maybe driving somewhere where they actually tell you what they're feeling. I mean, your talk, your work must be really difficult because a lot of it is guesswork. I mean, the, you hear what the parents say, the child probably says nothing. Where do you go from there? <laughs> I don't generally find that. I mean, I love working with teenagers. They're an absolute delight. You know, I have learned so much from from being with them. And and, and I think it's just, it's all about relationship. I mean, therapy is all about relationship. And I suppose asking the young person to tell me about their lives, I'm not the expert, they are. And just really trying to come alongside them and, and support them as much as I can. But learning about their world from them. I was going to ask you about schools, because you go into schools. Um, there was a time when schools had much more psychological input. They had somebody like a school psychologist or someone. But I think cuts have stopped a lot of that. How, how could schools do more? That's a tough one, because I, I think schools, again, are a bit lost in what support best to pull in. You know, And so sometimes people end up working with children and young people people in schools that are not necessarily qualified or they might have a teacher that's kind of identified as pastoral care but again they're not trained as counsellors or therapists so I, I think it's for me working in schools we're still very much in a behavioural model so the focus is on behaviours and kind of punishment I suppose for want of a better word and actually we need to be really moving away from that and looking at the meaning behind the behaviour especially if we're working with trauma and many children and young people in schools will have experienced kind of early adverse childhood experiences. So the more trauma-informed and the more systemic schools can work, the better, I think. And what other areas? So we've talked about parents and schools. Um, I hardly dare mention social media because it's got such a mixed press and view. Um, I know Previn Karian often says, hey, you know, it has a, does a lot of good, but... On the other hand, Alex, is it during the pandemic in particular where people were hanging on uh, the words of their friends because they weren't able to get to school, one hears it did a lot of harm, particularly in terms of image, self-image leading to eating problems? Yeah, I mean, I don't think I don't think everything can be placed in social media's kind of, you know, fault, I suppose. But I think it can, again, it can certainly magnify and be a, a distorted mirror. That's how I would sort of kind of term it I suppose that actually it become it can become someone's world and and it's and it's not true it's not a real mirror it's just some smoke isn't it and smoke and mirrors kind of thing it's, it's a distorted lens and so I think for children and young people that are vulnerable again to certain things if there's a vulnerability there already the comparison or getting drawn into something or who who can they trust to talk to and how do they know that that's not going to be shown to someone or leaked to someone in terms of images or messages and cyberbullying is is a very very real thing that I never had to experience you know when I was younger and it's, and it's very frightening it's very it really is uh, how much of that do you witness in your in your practice cyberbullying um, I have experienced some um, in terms of young people telling me about it. I suppose it's more that they've sent a message to someone or an image to someone um, and that kind of gets, yeah, sort of comes back at them, I suppose. So that that certainly has, I have experienced that with young people before. 
Now, I don't know if you're a psychotherapist who can dole out pills or whether you would anyway, because lots of psychotherapists believe that is simply not the answer. It's to talk it out, to get the stuff out. But what do you believe about giving young people antidepressants? Because we hear stories of children as young as 10 being given antidepressants. I think, I mean, I'm not a psychiatrist, so I can't diagnose and I can't medicate anyone. But but I, I do know, again, working with, with young people, that for some medication is really helpful. And alongside, I think as, as a therapist, we would always say medication and therapy, you know, that they can work. And for us as therapists to really work closely with psychiatrists or other people around the child or young person is really, really key that we're all kind of communicating and supporting them to sort of scaffold them as as a team, really, as a network around them, which is very different to kind of adult therapy in in my experience anyway. But I'm I'm not against medication, you know, at all. No. Okay, so you might refer somebody you were worried about to a, a psychiatrist, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because as therapists, we have to know our limitations. You know, it's it, I can't sort of diagnose someone. And if, if I'm worried about someone's mental health in terms of something being more um, needing a different kind of treatment, I suppose, or a different kind of support, then that's really important that I can kind of link up with a psychiatrist to, to support the young person. It's said that people and children, when they hurt themselves and in the end sometimes take their lives, are really furious about life about everything really that a lot of it stems from anger are you how many of the children you see are very angry i think we're all angry chrissy (laughs) do we admit it though you see (laughs) Uh, again it's a very complex area isn't it and i think there are many factors involved in why someone might take their life and why someone might feel suicidal or wanting to to hurt themselves in some way, whether that's internalized rage that gets you know put onto oneself or and that can't be expressed outwardly. But I think it, we're part of systems, and so working with children and young people, we're really mindful that we're working within systems. There's the school, there's the family, and there's all the other kind of systems around the child. So it's it's helping to address all the factors rather than just focusing on the child or the young person holding the problem. I suppose. Okay, well, Alex, I'll I'll bowl you another fast ball. Um, If they gave you the purse strings, um, so, okay, uh, old Sadi Javid says to you, here's the money. Now then, how would you like to spend it for children to make their lives better as adults? What must they have in the way of treatments now? I think we need long-term psychotherapy. I think services that used to offer long-term, particularly in schools, are now reducing like six to 10 sessions. And that, if someone is presenting with, uh, you know, quite disturbing kind of symptoms, I suppose, or is really, really struggling, or has experienced lots of trauma, six to 10 sessions is just not going to be enough. And you can't ask someone to sort of start to open up and then you have to, you know, kind of close them up again. And that that's just not really fair. So I think long term work is really important. Again, not everyone needs it. But knowing that that is a provision, I think, is really, really key. Now, I was just going to say also in terms of, you know, systemic working, it's we're all a bit fragmented. You know, we're not sort of all joining up together. And I suppose all the systems working together, you know, parents and school and social workers, we all need to come together in a very joined up fashion to be thinking about that young person. What does that mean? You all get in a room together and talk about a child? Yeah, yes. absolutely. And, and, in, and in schools also to have reflective space, which we call clinical supervision, which is paramount for us as practitioners that we have that, you know, we couldn't do our work without it. And yet other professionals working with children and young people don't necessarily have that same support. Do, do you do you feel very anxious for our children, for their futures? I mean, it's a rather broad question, but does, does it fill you with anxiety that they're not getting the backup? They're not getting this real help of lots of people sitting around a table and trying to give them help? I'm not sure if it makes me anxious. I think it makes me feel a bit despairing <laughs> um, or a bit hopeless. I think sometimes it can be hard to hold on to feeling making a difference because because it's just so overwhelming I mean when you think and so I just go what can I do what can I focus on how can I best support in the resources that I have available 
Um, but I think it can be it can feel just overwhelming when we think about it. And I think the systems are overwhelmed and therefore it's hard to stay connected. It's hard to stay hopeful, I think. Yes, because I think on in these times, we've talked about the benefits of people being it's a simple, it sounds simple enough, being heard that um, I think Andrew Samuels was talking about when he did ch- youth work in Wales, when he would just be on the end of some youth who was having a really rough time or in trouble, and he would just listen to that child. And the very act of listening made such a difference, which sounds simple, but I wonder if children feel listened to enough. I, I don't think so. I, I don't think so. I think, again, this comes down to the fact that children and young people are, are have very little autonomy over their lives and very little, little control over their lives and are very powerless in our society. And I think we can dismiss ch- children and young people, oh, it's just a phase or it's just this or it's your hormones. And actually, we all need to be validated. We all need to be listened to. We all need to be heard. And if we can start to do that earlier, then hopefully we won't come kind of come to the point where a child or young person has to really show how they're feeling in in quite worrying ways, I suppose. Well, we all look forward to the Child Psychotherapy Council being really in there and socking them one and making sure they actually do something at government level. Can can you promise us that, Alex? (laughs) No promises, but I mean, that is our hope and that is our desire and that is our fire that I think we all feel as a kind of team, as a group of professionals who really are passionate about this work and, and really want to make a difference as much as we can. We'll be watching with interest. And thank you very much for talking to me. Not at all. Thanks so much. Thank you.